of this election. Today I'm coming to you from Reading, Pennsylvania, and we are here for a special reason. I found out about this from a buddy of mine who lives in, in the area. We are at Almond, Almond Funeral Home here, and we're going to go see Stone Man Lee. I'm going to try to do this in a very dignified way as we're going into the funeral home and get the last look at um, Stone Man Willie, uh, who's going to be buried tomorrow. And what's special about Stone Man Willie is that he's been around for 128 years. He was uh, embalmed here, and the owner of the funeral home uh, back then embalmed them with a little bit very too much fluid and it kind of mummifies them so let's go inside and check out Stone Man Willie but we'll find out his real name because tomorrow I may be able to make it up here to go to his grave site um, to um, where they'll reveal his actual name He's known as Stone Man Willie, but that's not his real name. So let's go see him. Have you heard the name Stone Man Willie? Have you lurked at the front entrance of Almond's funeral home, working up the courage to ring the bell and ask for a peek? Are you part of the exclusive club who have actually seen him? If you are or ever were local to Berks County, Pennsylvania, you have likely heard the legends. But what is his truth? Why is he above ground 128 years after his death? The inception of the story dates to the fall of 1895, when a man died because of the much affair in the cell at First County Prison. Thousands of curious children and adults made their way to the portal to get the horse all in the course of the 20th century to get a glimpse of his heart and corpse. A morbid yet fascinating story. The truth about Stone Man Willie is not as interesting as it once was. So, what is the real story behind Burt's Cow's most famous mummy? Advances in technology have allowed thousands of historical records to be developed and searchable by keywords. This mysterious digital paper trail has led me to twist, turns, and truth, which provide Referencing original articles in the Red Time, the Lovely Cloud, and Beyond. This is the count of the Lovely Cloud, the Lovely Cloud, the 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 hours of October 7th, Lizzie Daughtridge, a servant sleeping in her bed at Morris Brown's boarding house, awoke to the man rummaging through her belongings. As she stirred, the man dove under her bed, and she caught a glimpse of his feet disappearing underneath. Somehow, keeping her wits about her, she calmly got up and left the room, locking the door behind her. She alerted others and authorities arrested the man yet again. The Monday, October 7th, 1895, Reading Eagle reported the man was a Philadelphia that was burglarizing all the rooms in boarding houses while the occupants slept. 
also reveals his identity as James Penn. That he was well known in Philadelphia police circles and has served time for breaking into homes. The same article also reported that as soon as Penn was locked up in his prison cell, he attempted to kill himself and tie his handkerchief into a noose, looping into a bars in the cell door and failed to hold his weight in the prison. Contrary to the commonly told version of the story, it is definitely not a suicide. In fact, Penn wouldn't die for another seven years. He spent that time suffering from what was believed at the time to be the infection of alcohol. On November 19, 1895, he succumbed to what Penn had done. reported that when Penn was told by Dr. Fife that his death was approaching, he revealed that James Penn was not his true name. to identify himself, Penn had a brother and sister who both lived in New York. He did not want to disgrace them. Unsure of what to do because his staff needs to buy him. industrialization brought to Victorian area was revolutionizing the way society lived. However, death was still the forefront of everyday life. Mothers frequently died in childbirth. Hanging still occurred in public squares, and diseases ravaged entire families. While Almond, using an unidentified man for his experimental embalming practices, could be regarded as barbaric by today's standards. It is important to understand the context of that time period. People have not stopped dying, but great strides have been made in medicine and disease control. Being shocked by the prospect of Stone Willie's existence underlies the progress that he was an essential part of. On November 22nd, the Red Eagle published an article titled A Slight Career, revealed that Penn's cellmate named James Clark had a few pieces of identifying information he claimed Penn confided to him. Clark was arrested the same week as Penn in the pickpocket during the fireman's convention. Clark claimed Penn was that he was a World War Year of age and he was from Waterford, Ireland. He also revealed that his father was a popular hotel keeper and ran a public house on the market square there for three decades. surface and a wild goose chase had begun. 
Berks County Prison's warden, Kinser, wrote to the mayor of Waterford, who disclosed that there was a man by that name who kept a hotel but had recently died. The mayor also disclosed that a daughter of the man ran a hotel in Dublin. When warden wrote to her, she claimed her brother was dead. A February 6, 1896 Times clipping indicates that the board of Birch County Prison directed Allman to dispose of the body of James Penn, effectively ending the involvement of the corpse. When the investigation by the prison warden dropped off, Allman himself picked up the trail. The Wilkes-Barre Times reported on March 7, 1896, that Undertaker Allman had received corresponding officials in Wilkes-Barre in reference to the identity of James Penn. It states that Allman was sure the man's real name was James Murphy in Wilkes-Barre. This didn't seem to pan out either. That was the last public mention in regards to identifying his corpse and Allman. Times reported that Pahowski mummy was positively identified by two completely different men, Philadelphian Paul Molson and F.J. Sebest, saloon keeper at 623 Willow Street in Reading. Sebest was quoted in the article, I thought his body had been buried. He sometimes came to my saloon. I never read such a body being an almond. No, I will not give his right name. He was known as Michael Pahowski. Let it go at that. Pahowski was buried in Hollenbach Cemetery Shore. Yeah. It is definitely not the Stone Man Willie that anyone reading this may have visited. This begs the question, exactly how many mummies almond create? Allman began his mortician career at age 20 in 1889 in a small building at North Third Street. He moved to the current 247 Pension site in 1902, which means Stonebury's body remained in also. It also means that the small building on North Third was home to at least two months for a four-year period between 1887 and 1901.
bedroom that Theodore C. Allman did it. The Allman mortuary business continued under son Theodore C. Allman Jr. and son-in-law Earl Angstead until 1975, when Theodore C. Allman III became the third generation to continue his grandfather's legacy. Theodore C. Allman III died in 2008, and the company was eventually bought out by Dignity Memorial, a regional chain of funerals homes.
Netflix television production titled The Mummy Roadshow, which aired 39 episodes over three seasons between 2001 and 2003. While the knowledge of Stoneman Willie's existence reached Conlow too late to be part of the Mummy Roadshow, Almond allowed him to conduct research privately. The result of the research are compiled in a chapter dedicated to Stone Man Willie in a book Conlog and his colleague Ron Beckett are writing. A total of 21 coins were retrieved from Willie's throat during his study, which revealed them to be pennies dated between 1896 and 1961. This means that visitors of Willie's were intentionally and perhaps putting the coins in his mouth over the course of nearly 70 years. It was surmised by colleagues of Congo that this was done as part of a European ritual to state back to the Greeks and Romans, where the coins were placed in the mouth of the system and reacquired in the Greeks. The researchers also found that this was a general organ, while they had shrunk and considered to be a bombing process. Some speculations came to draw about formaldehyde was primarily produced in Germany. It wasn't until 1900 that it became commercially available in the United States. Conlow concluded that Almond would have been one of the very first embalmers in the country to use this chemical as a human preservative. On April 26, 2023, WFMZ broke the story that Willie's caretakers at Almond were in the very initial stages of planning a burial. During a press conference on June 1st, the funeral home revealed that Willie will be a part of Reddit's 275th anniversary parade on June 30th. A public meeting will be held from October 2nd to the 6th, and his burial will occur on October 7th. Poetically, that week is also the 128th anniversary of the Fireman's Convention Week and his initial arrest. With under six months until Stoneman Williams returned, the window of opportunity to investigate and to identify the truth that has been us for generations is out there. A great search on Amsterdam.com via New York arriving passenger ship records in 2001, 10 year old Irish boy went to America.
cooperation from Willie's caretakers, we could crack this mystery wide open and bury him under stone bearing his true name. Excerpt from Stoneman Willie, A Search for the Truth by Alexa Fryman.